Would you bow your hearts together with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for what we have experienced with you and one another during this time of worship and fellowship together. And now realizing the importance of this two-part series that I'm beginning today, I'm offering myself as a vessel of fresh and new into your hands at this very moment. Please cleanse me with the washing of the blood of your dear son. Please anoint me with the power of your sweet Holy Spirit so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. So that your purpose, your design purpose might be accomplished for each of us as individuals, as families, and as a church collective. Because as I pray and praises for victories I give in Christ's name, amen. amen. Have you noticed how many television programs, movies, books, and magazine articles are being devoted to promoting life after death? Is this by chance or is there a motivating force behind the escalation of the exploration and broadcasting concepts of immortality and beyond grave experiences? It is not the intention of this two-part series on Do the Dead Know Anything to be either judgmental or critical. But I will be simply sharing from my mind and heart an outgrowth of my personal search, my personal search to discover scriptural truth about a crucial area of Bible doctrine. What does the Bible, not tradition, teach about immortality? What does the Bible, not tradition, teach about the state of the dead? What does the Bible and not tradition teach about hell? Today I'm sharing with us section number one. After shaking hands at the graveside, I got in my automobile and started home. The day had been very difficult because the funeral service had been for a fellow minister. As I drove home, there was a verse of scripture that kept rolling through my mind is found in Job chapter 14 and verse 14. If a man die, shall he live again? Though I had not preached this sermon of my fellow minister, God used this text in my mind and heart and it would not leave. Upon going to bed that night, sleep would not come, and there kept appearing in my sight the faces of every person whose funeral I had ever preached. Finally, I eased out of bed so as not to disturb my wife, proceeded to wash my face, went to the living room, opened my Bible to Job 14 and verse 14, and spent the remainder of the night studying what God's word said on the subject of death. What I discovered that night was to paint a view of death that altered my concept of God and has been a source of strength ever since. The question of Job 14 verse 14 was being used by God's sweet spirit to direct my attention to another question about which I had not given real thought. It's found in that same chapter, Job 14 and verse 10. But man dieth and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost. And where is he? As I sat on the sofa, and thought about Job 14 and verse 10, there was a provoking question that throbbed within my intellect and within my emotions. The question was this, state of the dead, is it a promotion, demotion, or no motion? 
In other words, when a person dies, does that individual immediately go to heaven or hell? In the language of Job, where is he? As far back as I could remember, I had heard that when a person dies, the soul immediately goes to heaven or hell. And on the eventful night of wrestling with this question, I had been teaching this proposition for several years. Let me briefly summarize the doctrine of death that I had been taught and had taught to others. It went like this. When a person died before the cross on which Jesus purchased salvation, the spirit or the breath went to God, the body to the dust, and the soul to Sheol, which is divided into two compartments. The lower portion was hell and for those, or was for those who died as sinners. The upper portion was paradise and was for those who died as followers of God. Between the compartments was fixed a gulf that no one could cross. The lower portion was a place of punishment and the upper place that of bliss. When Jesus died, rose from the tomb and ascended back to heaven, he carried paradise, that upper portion of Sheol, with him, and hell enlarged itself. And now on this side of the cross, when a person dies, the body goes to the earth, depending, uh, but the soul immediately to heaven or to hell, depending on whether that person dies as a Christian or not. In heaven there is rejoicing, but in hell there is weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. This is what I had been taught and had taught unto others. But the Bible relates, as we read a few moments ago, but man dieth and wasteth away, yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? And I must confess to you that I honestly thought I knew the answer to the question. As I began reading through that entire 14th chapter of the book of Job in order to gain a full context. When I arrived at Job 14 and verse 12, I encountered a serious problem in my interpretation. Listen. So man lieth down and riseth not, and underscore in your minds and hearts, till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. And I can still remember blinking several times and even rubbing my eyes, asking myself, did this passage actually intend to mean what it appeared to say? My sincerity about accepting the Bible as final authority was going to be challenged in the hours to follow. And sensing this in a grave way, I turned to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and read aloud verse number 16. All scripture. How much scripture? All. One more time. How much scripture? All. One more time. How much scripture? All. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. When I finished reading aloud that verse, I knelt and asked God's Spirit to be present with me as I began to study. When I rose from my knees, I got a concordance, a glass of cold milk, some paper and a pen, sat down at the dining room table with my Bible, and I wrote three words at the top of a sheet of paper. Where is he? Now, since I had been taught, and since I had taught 
for years that the dead go immediately either to heaven or hell, I wrote down these two words, heaven and hell. But now it seemed as though there was another possibility, sleep. Job said in Job chapter 14, verse 12, that we just read, Job said that the dead would not awaken out of sleep until when? Until the heavens be no more. And I can still remember reassuring myself, and I actually got up and walked to the window and looked outside upward, reassuring myself that the heavens are still in existence. And so according to Job, the dead are neither in heaven or in hell. I had to check this out fully. It was strange though. Instead of feeling threatened, I sensed relief taking hold of both my intellect and my emotions. Why? Because for years, I had had great difficulty adequately understanding and explaining to my own satisfaction 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. Listen closely. Paul, under Holy Spirit inspiration, wrote, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, now, underscore those words in your mind and heart, if not in your Bible. How many of you believe God wants us to be ignorant? Yeah. Not a single hand. God wants us to know some things, right? Yeah. And God wants us to know some specific things about this very important doctrine. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are present tense. Asleep. Now, what tense is it in? Present. Present tense. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus rose, died, and rose again, even so them which sleep, present tense, in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are present tense asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. That very night, I began to experience in my mind and in my heart the comfort spoken of in verse number 18. Because for years, I had wondered why. Why, if Christians are already in heaven, would Paul refer to dead Christians being asleep? And why? Why would he say that at the time of the return of Jesus, the dead in Christ shall rise first? Why did not he say they shall be brought down from heaven? Why did he write the dead shall rise first? The biblical portrait of death and resurrection began to dawn upon me. Paul was saying exactly what Job had said years before. When a person dies, he or she enters into sleep. And when Jesus returns, those who are asleep in him shall awaken to welcome the Lord. Amen. The dead in Christ will respond to the voice of the archangel, to the trumpet of God, as the graves lose their hold. Amen. And I must confess that I was rapidly getting excited. After settling down, 
I started reading every passage in the Bible that refers to death, immortality, and the soul. The following is what I found. I discovered from God's word that man is mortal, not immortal. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 records, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, I want you to notice the biblical formula. Dust plus breath of life equals living soul. Now, please follow me very closely here. God did not put a soul into Adam's body. God breathed into that body, and when the breath of God united with that body made of dust, the Bible says Adam became a living soul. Now, if man became a living soul... When the breath of life united with the body, then it stands to reason to take the breath of life away from the body leaves a dead soul. So dust minus breath of life equals dead soul. Now, one may inquire, Pastor Dan, doesn't this just mean that the body dies but the soul and mind live on? This is what I had been taught, and I had taught to others for years, that the body is mortal, but the mind, the soul, are immortal, or they live on immediately either in heaven or in hell. Now, let's continue to notice what the Bible and not tradition says as we consider this next question. Are some parts of man immortal and other parts mortal? Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. The wise man pen, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit or breath shall return unto God who gave it. So the Bible says, not only in this passage, but in other passages, that the body of man is mortal. It returns to the earth as it was. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. For the living know that they shall die, and underscore this next phrase in your mind and heart, if not in your Bible, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know what? The dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. And so this passage, as does other passages, says that the mind of man is also mortal. The mind stops functioning at the moment of death. What does the Bible say? The dead know how much? Nothing. The dead know not anything. I had been taught... And I had been teaching for years that the soul either immediately goes to heaven or hell for eternity. However, I discovered that the Bible teaches that the soul that sinneth does not live on in hell, but dies. Ezekiel Chapter 18 in verse 4. Now, God is speaking here, and I want you to listen very closely to what God says. Behold, all souls are mine, 
As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. And underscore these next words. The soul that sinneth, it shall what? It shall die. It does not say it shall live on forever and ever and ever in eternity in hell. The Bible says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, who was I to believe? I chose to discard tradition and believe God. But someone may say, Pastor Dan, I can see that possibility, but how about the believer in Christ? In Acts chapter 13, the Bible records that David was a man after God's own heart and did God's will. The same book of Acts records something else about David that I had never noticed until that time in my detailed study. It's what Peter said of David in Acts chapter 2 and verse 29. Listen very closely. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. Now remember, David is a man after God's own heart, right? He did the will of God, right? And notice what Peter was inspired to say. Let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David that he is present tense at the time of Peter saying these words, present tense, David is both what? Dead and buried. And his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Now, please follow me very closely here. On the day of Pentecost, after Jesus had died, after Jesus had rose from the dead, after Jesus had ascended back to heaven, Peter described David as still dead and buried. And to make it real plain, just in case someone might understand, not understand, Peter explained in verse 34. Listen closely. For David, present tense, is not what? David, present tense, is not ascended into the heavens. Now, we must remember that Peter made this statement concerning David on this side of the cross. Well, then, what happens to mortal man when he dies? If the sinner does not immediately go to hell... And the saint does not immediately go to heaven in the language of Job. Where is he? Since we've just looked at David, let's turn to the Old Testament and notice what God said, he about, said himself about the death of his servant. Now, I know of no greater authority than God. Would you agree with me? Amen. Now, notice what God said. In 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12. David, and when thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt what? Sleep. Sleep with thy fathers. Now, what did God say David would do at death? God said David would sleep. Is this what happened? The book of Acts gives us the answer. Acts chapter 13 and verse 36. Listen very carefully. For David, after he had served his generation by the will of God, did what? Fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. So what does the Bible say happened to David at death? He fell asleep. He fell asleep to await the resurrection of the just that will take place at the second coming of Christ. Next, I want us to look at John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, the Bible records that a friend of Jesus had become sick 
and Christ was asked to come and minister to him. And I want us to listen in on the conversation as Jesus traveled to the home of Lazarus with his disciples. John 11, beginning in verse number 11. And Jesus said to the disciples, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. How be it, and underscore these next words, Jesus spake of his what? Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that Jesus had spoken of taking a rest in sleep. And then Jesus saith unto them, how? Plainly. Jesus wanted them to understand. And so Jesus, as we would say in our modern vernacular, brought it home. He made it plain. Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, how did Jesus describe death? S L E E P, sleep. After teaching a wrong theory for years, I discovered the scriptures teach that man is mortal. And when man dies, he does not live on immediately in heaven or hell. And in fact, I found out that the word immortal is only used one time in all of the Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17. And in this one instant of this word being used, it is used in regard to deity and not man. Listen. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. But someone may inquire, Pastor Dan, doesn't the Bible say that man was created in the image of God? And since God is immortal, doesn't this mean that man must also be immortal? Good question. Man was made in the image of God. Therefore, the question which must be asked and answered at this juncture is this. Are there limitations? Or was man designed to be a little God? God knows all things. Does this mean that man knows all things? No. God is all powerful. Does this mean that man is all powerful? No. God is everywhere at once. Does this mean that man is everywhere at once? No. And neither was man endowed with immortality at creation. Now, please follow me very closely here. If mankind had been created as immortal, why would there have been the need for God to have provided the tree of life in the Garden of Eden? Now, I want to ask that question again, just in case you may have missed it. If mankind was made, was created as immortal... Why would there have been a need for God to have provided the tree of life in the Garden of Eden? So where did the idea arise that man has an immortal soul? I asked the question just a few moments ago, if God created man with limitations, or if God designed man to be a little God. To be sure, God never intended for man to be a God. But Satan appealed to this possibility. I remind us of Genesis chapter 3 beginning in verse number 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, 
Hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the first lie heard by human ears was uttered by Satan. And notice the subject of that lie, immortality and death. Verses 4 and 5. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. My brothers and sisters, just as Adam and Eve had to make a decision, we must choose whether we will believe God and his word or Satan and his lie. To be sure, God was hurt that Adam and Eve believed the lie of Satan and desired to be as gods. But as hurt as Father God was, God still loved man. And oh, how God's love is displayed in Genesis 3, verses two, uh, 22 and 23. Listen with all of your mind and all of your heart. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and do what? And live forever. Therefore the Lord sent him forth from the garden of Eden. Can you see the wisdom of this, my friends? Can you see the wisdom of this? i got to ask it one more time. Can you see the wisdom of this? Because man had sinned, and because God loved man so much, the compassionate creator would not allow sinful man the opportunity to eat of the tree of life. Satan would have liked for man to have eaten of the tree of life so that man would be forever a sinner. But God had other plans. Amen. God did not want man to be a slave to Satan for all of eternity. You see, true, man was not created with an immortal soul, but God desired then and still desires today for man to live forever, not as a sinner. And so the soul that sins, it shall die. But God desires for us to live forever as a saint. Is this not the meaning of John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not what? Perish. But have what? Everlasting. Everlasting life. Now please follow me closely here. The most quoted Bible verse teaches exactly opposite of what I had been taught and had taught to others. John 3.16 teaches that everlasting life is not something with which we are born, but rather comes as a gift from the loving Heavenly Father, only as a result of accepting Jesus as Savior. Amen. State of the dead. Is it immediate promotion to heaven for the Christian? No. Is it immediate demotion to hell for the sinner? No. So where are the dead? The dead are in a state of no motion. They are asleep, saint and sinner alike, until the appropriate resurrection for each. And praises be unto God for the promise that soon something wonderful is going to happen to sleeping saints. 
Remember that Job believed that he would sleep till the heavens be no more. And in that same chapter, the question was asked, if a man dies, shall he live again? And Job did not hesitate in answering. Instantly, he responded in Job 14 and verses 14 and 15 with these words. All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Thou shalt call and I will answer thee. What was he talking about? He was expressing a message of hope. You see, sure man sleeps in the grave after death, but the Christian knows that the grave will not be able to contain us forever. Soon Jesus will return, and we as Christians have the hope of John 5, verses 28 and 29 as an anchor of our soul. Listen from the gracious lips of our Savior. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are present tense, where? In the graves. Notice they are not in heaven. Jesus said, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming when all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life. When this takes place, sleeping saints will arise from the graves of earth and of sea. Some will have been waiting for centuries and some for only a short period of time. But regardless of how long they have been waiting, when the voice of Jesus calls them forth, they're going to answer with their entire being, and a transforming change is going to take place. Paul described it in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. The identical change that Job anticipated. <laughs> Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all what? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. You see, there will be dead, sleeping saints, and there will be live, watching saints when Jesus returns. And Paul says at that moment, we all will be changed. So when will Christians be changed? When Jesus returns. Are we sure? Look at verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. You see, all the other trumpets of the book of Revelation will have already sounded. This is going to be the last trump. And Paul says, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. That is exciting. That's so exciting to me. You know what I feel like saying about now, don't you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But as exciting as that was to me, there is more. Verse 53. For this corruption must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on what? Must put on immortality. So when do Christians receive immortality? At the time of physical birth? No. At the time of spiritual birth? No. The Bible teaches that Christians will receive immortality when Jesus comes a second time and all of us will receive immortality together. I've got news for you. You are not going to shout on Hallelujah Boulevard before I do. <laughs> and I'm not going to shout on Hallelujah Boulevard before you do. We're all going to shout together. And I've already put in a reserve for Little Creek Fellowship, Little Creekers, to be together. <laughs> I need to ask you this question. Who is your friend? You see, to accept that the righteous go to heaven at death is to believe, now follow me closely, 
is to believe that death is the great friend of the Christian. Understand what I'm saying? However, the Bible plainly teaches in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 26 that death is our enemy. And so because I wanted Jesus to be my friend and not death, when I came to this place in my study, I pushed back my chair, I knelt, and I asked with great remorse in my mind and in my heart for God to forgive me of my wrong, misguided teaching on the subject of death and immortality of the soul. Several months later, Rebecca shook me from a sound sleep and asked, do you mean to tell me that my grandmother's not in heaven? I mumble, Rebecca, what are you talking about? And she shook me again and she said, well, according to what you're teaching now, when a person dies, he or she goes to sleep. Do you mean to tell me that my grandmother is not in heaven. I raised up, looked at the clock, and proceeded to give Rebecca there in bed a Bible study on the state of the dead. At the end of our study, she placed her head on my shoulder and sighed, speaking these words. That is one of the most beautiful teachings I've ever heard. Now, before I make the next statement, I need to say this, and it's going to make Rebecca blush. When she was carrying our first daughter, Salome, Rebecca could sleep 26 hours a day, <laughs> nonstop. And Rebecca spoke these words after a long pause. Just think, if I die before Jesus returns, I can sleep uninterrupted. <laughs> what a refreshing rest that will be. And with this thought in her mind and heart, Rebecca spent a restful night. And after a while, of meditation, I went back to sleep myself, claiming the comforting truth that if we die as Christians before the second coming of Jesus, we will indeed sleep. But the next sound we hear will be the voice of Jesus beckoning us to awaken to the delights of immortality. If we die as Christians before the second coming of Christ, we will indeed sleep. But the next sight we see will be that of the glorious face of Jesus welcoming us to the delights of immortality. I want to be ready to meet him, don't you? Whether I'm alive or whether I'm asleep. Father God, I want to thank you for the opportunity of sharing this very simple lesson today. And we are told through one of your anointed messengers in a very special book, The Great Controversy, page 588, that in the closing hours of earth's history, there will be two issues that Satan will use to lead people astray. And one of the issues is the immortality of the soul. Father, I am praying for myself and I am praying for my friends who may have heard this message today. May none of us be deceived. May all of us choose to believe you and your word and not Satan who is the author and father of lies. Lead us all the way, Father, from here to the other side because this prayer I pray and praises for victories I give 
In Christ's name, amen.